just uh, turn the recording on and it has come on. Good. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 209, our course on holiness. Uh, we are a little late for the class today. Apologize, I ran over time in our earlier class, but uh, let's uh, pray together and we'll get started. We'll do the best we can with the time we have. Could I please request somebody to pray with us as a class and then we'll get started. Anyone? Go ahead, Prabhakar, would you like to pray? Sorry, Prabhakar Rao. Can I pray, Pastor? Sri Kumar, go ahead. Okay. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful morning which you have given to us, O Lord. Lord, we commit ourselves before your presence mm -hmm. and we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit and wisdom and revelation. Strengthen your servant, O Father God. Lord Master, let every word which is going to come out from his mouth, let it be directly from the throne room of God and let it, Lord Master, edify our faith. Lord Master, let it build, O oh Lord Master, our wisdom, our knowledge and understanding, O oh Lord Master, of your word, of your plan for each one of our life, O oh God. We submit everything into your mighty hand and we ask you, Father, lead us and guide us and let it be a blessing for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Shri Kumar. All right, once again, welcome everybody. Uh, we are continuing our journey in this course on holiness, where our goal is, first of all, to get a revelation of the holiness of God, and then to see how that holiness, the holiness of God can be reproduced in our lives and then revealed through our lives or expressed through our lives. We are in chapter three, though we got into chapter three last week, uh, when, we, when we were just making this transition on God's holiness being uh, reproduced in us. So I'm going to quickly review some of the things we covered last week in chapter three and then go forward uh, and we'll cover as much ground as we can uh, hopefully get into chapter four today. All right. So here's chapter three. We were talking about this last week when we said, you know, God's holiness, God wants his holiness to be reprodu reproduced in us. One of the covenant, covenant names that he gave is Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord your sanctifier, or the Lord who makes you holy. So not, not only is he the holy one, but he's also our Lord who makes us a holy people unto himself. And so we talked about certain of these aspects that we see parallel in both Old and New Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, priests were holiness to the Lord. New Testament, same thing. We are priests unto our God, and he calls us to be holy. Uh, in the New Testament, he calls us as saints or holy ones. And we saw several references on that. He says we are called to be holy in all our conduct. We have been called with a holy calling or we've been called not to uncleanness, but in holiness. So uh, this is something very clearly stated in both the Testaments, and of course, our emphasis is on what's stated in the New Testament, that he has called us to be holy to himself. And what we were trying to highlight last week was when we talk about holiness being formed in us, we should look at it as a call to be like God and to share in his nature and also as a call to belong completely to him. It means holiness is not 
an invitation to adapt a set of rules, a set of do's and don'ts. And sometimes, or I should say, traditionally, that's what it seems to be have been communicated or the way it was communicated was, well, be holy, do this, don't do this. So, you know, maybe you're, uh, maybe you were, you had a list of five do's and don'ts and uh, to move to a higher level of holiness, now we have 10 do's and don'ts. And then to move to another level of holiness, you have 20 do's and don'ts, you know. So traditionally, it was perceived like that, but it's not about do's and don'ts, but it's about sharing in the very nature of God, because God is holy. And it is about being completely set apart for God, being completely his, I belong completely to him. So actually it's an honored position. It's a place of honor to be a people for himself. And we see this truth being revealed both in both testaments. Uh, we said in the Old Testament, he, you know, God was saying, look, you're a chosen people to be a people for himself. Your holiness to the Lord. New Testament, and this way we stopped. Uh, he says, you are a chosen generation. You know, you're God's own special people and you are the people of God. So the emphasis is not on all the rules, all the do's and don'ts. The emphasis is on being his own, being the people of God. So, you know, if you look at it in the Old Testament, of course they had the law, but God was trying to, the essence of it was, look, you are the people of God. But, you know, you need to be empowered by God to be that people. You cannot do it on your own. New Testament, you are the people of God and you've been empowered by God to be that. You have been invited to share in his life and nature and he empowers you by his spirit to be a holy people for himself. And that's what we must take a hold of and live out of. So that brings us to, you know, this point where we should try and define or try to not define, but try to explain or express what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be holy? So as a New Testament believer, how should I understand being holy? I understand God is holy. Everything about him is holiness. He, he adorns his house in holiness and all his angelic beings are worshiping him and everything must take place in the beauty of holiness. Now, what does it mean for me to be holy? Right? So first of all, it starts off by saying, God is my sanctifier. Means God is the one who is, makes me holy. He imparts to me the quality that is the nature and the state or the position of being holy. It comes from him. It's not something I achieve on my own, but it's something God gives to me and God works in me, in us, by his grace and by the work of his spirit. So holiness is not my achieving something. Holiness is me receiving what God is giving to me. And he is the sanctifier. It starts with him. So he is doing his work in me. That's holiness. Rather than, the, the emphasis is not on you come up to this level on your own. No. The emphasis is on I am making you holy because I am Jehovah Mekadesh. I am the Lord, your whole, the one who makes you holy. And he does it by imparting both the quality and the position of being holy. And we are answering yes to the call of God. We are saying, yes, Lord, do it in me. Okay. 
So I, I, I know I'm repeating this because um, uh, for some of us, uh, you know, who may have been, uh, you know, brought up in traditional Christian settings, for many of us, or I, I should say for some of us, uh, holiness traditionally has been this idea of rules and regulations, you know, uh, what you wear, what you don't wear, what you eat, what you don't eat. But the reason I'm emphasizing it is we need to shift from rules and regulations to this is God doing something in me. And I'm just saying yes to his work in my life. And I'm, I'm responding to him with a yes. And it's us recognizing and celebrating that all of us belong to him completely. So, and as we get, a, get further into this, if we have this mindset, you know, when we face temptation, when we face the attractions of the world, when we face the pressures of the world to do something that is sinful, if we just, you know, remind ourselves, you know, I belong to God. All of me belongs to him. Every part of me, spirit, soul, and body belongs to him. Then I don't have any, I, I don't have anything to do with this thing. This is unlike God. This is unlike who he is. then it becomes easy for us to just walk away. So this is not God. Because we have said yes to his work in us, of him reproducing his nature and his holiness in us. We have said yes to that. And we said all of us belong to him. Therefore, I do not want any part of me to be involved in something that's unlike him. So, in order for God to do his work in us, he has actually set the stage. He has actually made it possible. And these are truths we all know, but we need to put it in context. Like put it in this context, in the context of holiness. We recognize that God himself has broken the power of sin over our lives. He did that. And he himself has made us a new creation in Christ and set us apart for himself in Christ. So this is the work of God. And this is like, this is where it begins. That God, so holiness begins at the cross. Where does holiness begin? For us, working holiness in us begins at the cross the recognition that on the cross the power of sin over my life over our lives was broken and because the power of sin was broken you and I don't need to be in subjection to sin whatever form or appearance it may have and the way God is working it out is he's brought me into Christ and set us apart for himself in Christ. And then, of course, we get into the practical side of it, which is how does God practically empower us to say no to the pressure of temptation, to the attractions of this world, uh, to, the, you know, to the influences around us? How does he practically help us do it? And that's, that's you know, through his spirit, through his word, uh, through divine discipline, and he helps us do it. So this, this is a practical sign uh, we're going to talk about, get into uh, when we talk about overcoming sin. But where does it begin? And where does our ability to be holy, where does it start? When we understand that the power of sin over our lives has been broken. And this is going back to, you know, what we learned in our very first course um, in, in the first semester about being in Christ. Then we said in Christ, we understand that 
the old man was crucified with him. It was crucified with him. So that the body of sin, that is the power of sin, is done away with. So we no longer are slaves of sin. So when Christ died on the cross, the, we were crucified. What part of us was crucified? That old sinful nature that we had in us. The very nature that was in our spirit being of sin was crucified, put to death. So that the power of sin over our lives is broken. So starting off with this understanding is so important. It's so important. Because we're not left to, you know, do it yourself kind of thing. Tried by their own efforts uh, to get out of sin, get out of any kind of bondage. No. We look to the cross and say, Lord, on the cross, the power of sin over my life was broken. So sin has no dominion over me. So, and getting this understanding is key. It's so important for us as we uh, learn how to walk in holiness before God. That God is our sanctifier. In order to sanctify us to himself, he began the work on the cross. What did he do on the cross? He broke the power of sin on the cross. So Jesus not only paid for sin, he broke the power of sin so that we could be dead to sin and alive to God. And sin does not have to reign in our mortal body to obey it. Instead, we can present ourselves to God. Right? So this presenting ourselves to God in Romans 6 and verse 13 is where we do so by an act of our will. We say, God, I am yours. And I recognize the power of sin over my life is broken. And I'm presenting myself, spirit, soul, and body, every part of me, I'm presenting to you to be a instrument of righteousness or holiness to God. Right? And so here we become slaves of righteousness resulting in holiness. Romans 6 verse 19. So I'm presenting, this is an act of my will, I'm presenting my body I'm presenting my soul as a slave of righteousness. So I am presenting to God. So God's done his part. He's saying, look, I've broken the power of sin over your, over your life. You have a choice now. You can present yourself as my slave, meaning completely mine, and it will result in holiness. You can be a slave of God, the way Paul puts it, meaning you're completely, you're surrendered completely to God and the fruit will be holiness. Your fruit will be holiness, Romans six twenty two. Your fruit will be holiness. Or you could be the other kind of a believer where you believe in Jesus and God indeed has broken the power of sin. But instead of walking in that, the believer is still living controlled by the soul and the body. And then you won't see holiness in that person because they're going to continue doing what's sinful. So this is where the choice is put on our side. God is Jehovah Mekedes, the Lord who is sanctifying us. In order to practically work that out in our lives, the first thing he did was he broke the power of sin over our lives. And he said, sin has no dominion over you. Sin 
shall not have dominion over you. You're not under law, but under grace. Under law, that is under the Old Testament, there was no empowering. Under grace, there is empowering. God says, I've broken the power of sin. But there's something God cannot do, which only we can do. What is it? We must present ourselves. God extends the invitation and says, look, I broke the power of sin. Would you like to present yourself as a slave for righteousness? So that's a choice we make. And we say, God, my whole being, spirit, soul, and body, I'm presenting to you. I want to be yours. I want you to work that righteousness out in me. And the result will be holiness formed in me and expressed through me. And that's a process, but that's what we're going to learn. How, when we present ourselves to God, how he works that out in our lives. Right? So now, don't get frustrated with yourself that, well, I went to God and I said, God, I, I'm presenting myself to you. I thank you for breaking the power of sin over my life. I am yours. Here I am, spirit, soul, and body. I surrender all, Lord Jesus. And after you do that, you still end up doing something. You know, it's not pleasing to God. Well, don't condemn yourself. We are going to learn how God is going to work that out. Once we present ourselves, that means we say, God, yes, I want to be a slave of righteousness. I want to be a slave of God. We're going to learn how God works that right, righteousness or holiness in us so that it can be formed in us and expressed through us. God will work it out, work in us. And that's the, the practical process we are going to learn how he does that. And once we learn how God works that out, you know, we can perfect holiness in our lives. We can see that happen in our lives. To the point where, like John writes in First John, we do not practice, or let me put it in a positive way, we practice righteousness. That means it becomes the way we live. It's our practice. It's a normal thing to do. That is, we practice right to the point where John can say, whoever is born of God does not sin. What he means is we don't practice unrighteousness. Just whoever is born of God cannot sin because his seed remains in him. So God will bring us to that place where we don't have to sin. We don't practice unrighteousness or we practice righteousness. That becomes the normal way of life. But it starts here with the recognition that the power of sin of our lives is broken and we are making a deliberate choice to present our ourselves, our whole being, as slaves of righteousness or slaves of God because we seek the fruit of holiness in our lives. Right? Paul repeats this, you know, he, and I'm just picking up a few verses here in Titus 2. He says, you know, Jesus gave himself for us, Titus 2.14, that he might redeem us or set us free from every lawless deed, from every lawless deed. Every lawless deed or every sinful deed or every deed that's not uh, acceptable to him. He says, he, he, he died. So he will set us free. He could set us free from every lawless deed. And we could be this people, his own special people. So that's holiness. We are his own special people. That's what we've been emphasizing. But he died in order to do that, make it possible. So, in order to work holiness in us, God made the provision. Step one, he did it on the cross. And we embrace that. Jesus, I embrace it. Because you broke the power of sin, I declare that sin will not have dominion over me. Will not control me in any way, shape or form. It starts with that understanding of the cross. And then, the second part is that we are now in Christ, right? 
in Christ, he says, all things have passed away. Everything has become new. So we embrace this truth. God, I am a new man. We embrace this truth. God has done this for us. You're a new man on the inside. In, the, in your spirit, your spirit has been born again. It is not just a renovated man that is okay. I got a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new. No. So you are not, your spirit does not have the old nature and the new nature. It doesn't. These cannot coexist. Your spirit is a new man. You see, here again, uh, uh, there, there was, I don't know how, how prevalent it is today, but there used to be all of this teaching, especially in, uh, at least where I heard it was, you know, the traditional evangelical churches, where we were told that, you know, uh, you have a sinful nature, you have a, you know, your born again nature. And so, you know, you have both and that's why you still sin. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you're born again, you have a new man. And this new man is created in the image of God. And what about this new man? This new man is righteousness, true righteousness and holiness. So this born again man, which has the life and the nature of God, that born again man or this born again human spirit has the life and the nature of God. It has been born in the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. That means this, you have the capacity, or if you want to put it like this, the DNA for righteousness and holiness. Of course, you have to grow. It has to grow in us. It has to become strong in us. But what is its DNA? Righteousness and holiness. So the born again human spirit, the new man, is not a sinful creature. It's not a sin-filled creature, no. It is created in the image of God and capable of righteousness and true holiness. You know, so let me put it like this. If the born again spirit lived without the soul and the body, the only thing we would see is righteousness and holiness. If the born again spirit, I mean, if you just took that born again human spirit out, what would you see? Righteousness and holiness. That's the new man. But the problem is this born again human spirit is in the soul and in the body, which are, you know, sinful. Which has been so used to living, uh, you know, th in doing, thinking and doing things that are against God. So... What happens, there is the pull of doing wrong things and so on. But the humans, born again human spirit, has the life and the nature of God in true righteousness and holiness. Right? And we see this repeated in many places. Uh, we are familiar with these truths of being in Christ. In Christ, we have, you know, Jesus himself is our sanctification. That means Jesus is our holiness. Jesus, we've been in Christ, we've been set apart the way Christ himself has been set apart unto God and we are sanctified unto God. Again, all of these simply mean holiness unto God, right? So two key truths for us to embrace. The power of sin on the cross on the cross, the power of sin was broken. In Christ, we are new man that's been set apart unto God. So spiritually, that's where we are starting out. So your human spirit is starting out with this, free from the power of sin and with the life and the nature of God. But then, holiness has to be worked out from the spirit to the soul and to the body. So that that true righteousness and holiness can govern 
our thinking, our speaking, our act, every part of us. Right? So that's the process of holiness that is being worked out. So Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14 are very interesting. It says, you know, again, it's talking about the cross that we have been sanctified through what Jesus did for us on the cross, for the offering of the body of Christ. So we have been sanctified. So the work was of making us holy unto God was done on the cross. And he has made us complete. But verse 14 says, we are being sanctified. So it's being worked out in our lives. So it's God completed the work that, that completed work is now being worked out in our day-to-day -day lives. So that's how God works. He completes it in the spirit, and then he says, okay, now let me work it out in your practical life, in your soul, and in your body. And how do you live? Right? So that's what we refer to as sanctification, or the process of holiness. That means God has already finished the work, but now he's working it out in me, in my everyday life. And we need to learn how this is going to happen. So how, you know, uh, the, just to give touch on the practical things and then I'll take some time for discussion. You know, in the sanctification of our mind and body, that means uh, our thoughts and our words, you know, so we have to move from thinking ungodly, unholy, to thinking thoughts that are pure. So our minds, let's say example, uh, 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 when we were unbelievers, our mind, our thoughts, our imaginations were unholy. And you know we would engage in unholy thoughts. But then now, he's going to change that and bring us to the place where our thoughts are holy and lovely, noble and pure. And if an unholy thought comes, it's repulsive to us. Uh oh, I, I don't want that here. It has no more part in me. Now, it's the mind is moving from or the, our thought processes and thought patterns and imaginations are moving from what was unholy to what is holy. How does God do that? And that has to happen. Similarly with our speaking, maybe we were like, you know, the Bible says filthy speaking, foolish talking, coarse jesting, speaking lies, corrupt words. And now we are moving from that kind of language to speaking to something that's pure, holy. God is bringing about that change. Or in our desires and affections, our passions, the bodily desires and appetites, you know, uh, sexually, we could have been sexually immoral, doing things that were not pleasing to God, but then we are moving from that to being, a, you know, being holiness to God, even in our passions, desires, and appetites, and our affections. God is sanctifying our passions, affections, and desires. Or in our hopes and dreams and ambitions, God is sanctifying that. And practically, he's working that out in the way we use our time, talents, and money. You know, we could have been wasting a lot of time, and uh, I'm not saying it's wrong, but, you know, maybe movies were or just just time was spent in lots of other things that may not necessarily be pleasing to God or useful or edifying and then now the time talents and money is being set up for for God holiness is being worked in our lives and in our family home and possessions God is working holiness in these areas so God has finished the work then he's got to work it out in all these aspects of our lives. And what we want to learn is how 
Is God going to do that? How can we see it happen in our lives? How can we make this journey in of holiness in our personal lives? Okay, so that's what we're going to learn. I'm going to pause here. And uh, this is just the end of chapter three. And let's take up some time for discussion. All right. All right, I see one question here from Divya. So the new creation is in the spirit, right? Yeah, so the answer is yes. So in the spirit, we have become a new creation, a new man, a new person. So the spirit, the human spirit has been born again, made a new creation and has received the life and the nature of God. And the spirit does not have the old man, doesn't have sinful nature. You know, the old man is another phrase that is used to refer to the sinful nature. It doesn't have that. It is the new man. It has the life and the nature of God. It has uh, it, it, this new man, this life and the nature of God, is capable of righteousness and true holiness. That's the spirit, human spirit. But remember, the human spirit has to grow. Uh, this has to be developed in us, and we have to affect, let it affect our soul and our body. All right, Maggie, Thanks, your question, friend. and Christopher, your question, please, Maggie. Thank you, sir. Um, just a, a question on the First Corinthians th uh, three, verse one to three, where Paul said that he, he couldn't address them because they, most of them, they could not address them as a mature believer mm. because most of them were still car carnal. So just want to know, what's the difference if someone has been born again and the Spirit of God is in him, even though uh, he's not mature yet in, in, in the things of the Lord, but has been justified and has been, he's a new creation. So how could Paul, can Paul call someone who is a believer, Colonel? And please, please explain mm. or clarify. Uh, yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So we see this uh, both in First Corinthians chapter three, and also in Romans chapter eight, the first part of Romans eight. That's verses one to thirteen, where Paul is writing to believers writing to saints, you know, he begins his letter <laughs> in a very nice way to the saints, holy ones. Very good. But he proceeds to call them carnal. He says, you are carnal. Well, he just referred to them as saints. That means in Christ, they are saints. But the way they are living, they are living carnal. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, you're living like mere men. You're living like ordinary people. He called them saints, but now he's rebuking them, saying you're living like ordinary people. What does it mean? In Romans 8, he explains it. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So there's a choice we have to make. You know, we are in Christ. We are sanctified in Christ. We are saints in Christ. But in the way we live on earth, we have a choice. We can live according to the flesh or we can live according to the spirit. Then he continues. He says, you know, in that same Romans 8, he says, if you live a you know, to be carnally minded is death. So because a carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. It cannot be. So, so here's the problem. The word carnal simply means to be flesh ruled, fleshly. That means the affections 
and the desires are set on things that are displeasing to God. So if I walk according to or in submission to these desires of the lust of the flesh and of the mind, I'm a carnal Christian. Whereas if I could, if I live according to the spirit, according to what God has done for me in my spirit, then I can walk in the spirit. So who is a carnal Christian? Based on Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 3, these are people, believers, who are in Christ, but in the day-to-day -day life, they're living according to the flesh and according to the mind, the, the sinful desires of the mind. So that's a carnal Christian. And so in that Christian, you don't see the life of God. You don't see the holiness of God being expressed. So that's what he's addressing. Got it, Maggie? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, sir. Christopher, your question, please. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Um, my question is actually uh, is more like a lifestyle kind of question um, and an observation also. So there are um, uh, denominations and even other religions who have, um, uh, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, in, in quotes, uh, holy, holy uh, people, or holy men, um, who are, you know, who have sort of given up on, given up on some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, cares of the of of the world, uh, also have, you know, kind of uh, withdrawn from 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 society, and um, uh, want to try and achieve. This uh, level of communion with 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 God, um, and um, even in even in some some Christian denominations, they have uh, certain uh, uh, communities that uh, you know, in a sense, close to themselves, and uh, you know they don't uh, they don't actually uh, you know be a part of the world. And uh, I'm just thinking of you know even. Um, Apostle Paul, uh, after you know Jesus appeared to him, uh, there was a period of time where uh, I'm not sure how many years, but uh, where he, you know, spent time um, maybe in his in his in his in his business. But I think he, you know, he possibly could have also you know strengthened a lot just uh, you know being uh, away from uh, uh, from the world before he could actually uh, you know be. Uh, such a such a strong uh, uh, person uh, in in uh, uh, you know in in uh, bringing Christianity uh, to the to uh, to to the people. So I guess my my question is um, for some 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 of us who may not have responsibilities of uh, you know family. Uh, in fact, Apostle uh, uh, Paul even had you know suggested that you know not having a family uh, could you know, could also help to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, make this, uh, make, make a difference in the, you know, the way uh, one uh, lives, a, lives a life as a Christian. So I guess the question is, for, for some, some, for some people, uh, would that be a, a lifestyle, you know, where they are uh, not, you know, in a sense, they have withdrawn from, from the world. And um, be uh, and are able to, you know, maintain this level of holiness uh, uh, easier, maybe easier from 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 the, from the other people. So that that's really my question. So um, I just trying to understand a question. Uh, is the question uh, like are we saying, uh, you know, people who withdraw from the world to get, uh, you know, they live in some very cloistered environment? Is holiness easier for them as opposed to those of us who are engaged in the day-to-day -day things of life? Is that the question? Uh, yes, and also uh, in relation to that, um, could that be also, uh, you know, a lifestyle that um, that could be, uh, uh, you know, that one could subscribe to, and um, you know, um, 
which you know which is just another another part towards uh, towards towards holiness hmm. so uh, if you you know uh, a very quick answer would be right there in first corinthians 7 when paul is uh, you know talking about life and marriage and all of that. And, and, and basically what he says, and I'll just, uh, you know, uh, um, pick out a few verses there. First Corinthians 7, he says, you know, uh, basically he's saying, you know, in whatever way God has called you, remain there, verse 17, you know, as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called, stay there. And yes, he does say, you know, okay, if you're not married, you will, you will be able to spend more attention to the things of God and so on. But he says, the, uh, you know, verse 20, that each one remain the same calling in which he was called. Uh, and then, you know, if and for those of us who are using the world, which is, um, uh, let me give you the exact verse here. Um, uh, uh, this is in yeah uh, so for those of us who are engaged with the world um, so uh, verse I think this is verse 30 those who weep and those who rejoice they do not rejoice to buy as they do not possess um, so he's not so where's this phrase here Uh, this is in First Corinthians 7, I'm not able to find, oh yeah, verse 31. For those who use this world as not misusing it for the form of the world is passing away. So, so he's not really advocating that we, uh, you know, if you read First Corinthians 7, thing, verse 20 on to, to verse 30, he's not advocating that we all disconnect from the world, but in how we engage with the world, we can do it in such a way, like he says in verse 30, those who use the world as though they are not misusing and that means i'm engaging with the world but i'm not and that is that's not my priority or it's not the main thing for me so to answer your question you know is it going to be easier for somebody uh you know who's who's disconnected from the world they go away separately to live a life of holiness maybe to some extent but not necessarily because you know remember that uh, ultimately, our thoughts and every part of us has to be consecrated to God, whether we are inside of a closed environment or whether we are out there in the world being exposed to whatever is happening. Uh, ultimately, you know, our, our, we have to be consecrated to God. Perhaps, you know, living a life of seclusion may to some extent, but not entirely, make it easy. But I just want to say this, that God has not called all of us to do that. In fact, you know, in, in, in Luke 19, the commission is occupy till I come. So, you know, Jesus gives talents to all of these people and his commission to them is occupy or engage with the world till I come. That's what he tells us. You know, occupy till I come, you know, do business with the world till I come. So that's the commission in Luke 19. So we are actually sent into the world. And so God would call different ones of us to, you know, engage with the world in different ways. And he needs us there so that we can be salt and light. We can have influence. We can have impact for the kingdom. Uh, uh, so practically, it would not be possible for all of us to disengage from the world. But uh, to some extent, you know, to those who do disengage, uh, maybe it's a little easier, but not entirely because ultimately consecration has to take place, spirit, soul, and body. And that can happen whether we are engaged with the world or separated from the world physically, it doesn't matter. I hope I answered your question. I <laughs> said so many different things. Okay. All right. Um, thank you all for patiently holding up today. I know uh, we went over time, both our classes, but uh, I, I appreciate your patience. Uh, let's wrap up today. Can somebody please pray and dismiss us? Uh, we'll pick this up, uh, pick up this class on Wednesday. Could somebody pray and dismiss us, please? Anybody? Wants to pray? Shall I pray, Pastor? Please go ahead, Avni. Thank you. Thank you, Father God. Thank you for what we have learned, Father. Thank you, Lord Father, for 
leading us to live a life of holiness, Father, in helping us renew our minds, be aligned to the word, Father. And Lord, Father, thank you that you are so very generous, loving and caring towards us, Father, that you are day after day, night after night, Father, talking to us through your word, Father, and helping us grow more in your word and be enriched by it, Father. We thank you for Pastor. We thank you for anointing him to lead us into life of holiness, Father. We truly want to consecrate ourselves this morning, Father, and surrender our thought, word, actions, and deed at your feet so that we may be uh, we may become what you intend us to become, Father. So we completely give ourselves to you, Father, and we once again thank you for this time of togetherness, fellowship, and learning. Bless us all with your divine wisdom and favor and lead us in your paths of righteousness for your name's sake, Father. Once again, we thank you. Bless everyone who's here and continue to, uh, Lord Father, lead us in the matchless and precious name of Jesus, our Savior. We ask and pray this prayer. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and um, see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Harrison. God bless. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. God bless, bless you. God bless.